Hi, it's Katrina. Lost Jungle City. In a Central American forest, archaeologists have discovered a lost city slowly becoming one with the jungle. What's truly amazing about this city isn't its ruined buildings or its mysterious past. It's the fact that researchers found it to be home to animals previously thought extinct. The mysterious ruins were found in Honduras, in La Mosquitia Forest, close to the border of Nicaragua. This is one of the largest, densest, and least explored rainforests anywhere in the world. But scientists didn't even take an interest until 2013, when a team of archaeologists started looking for ruins. They used light detection and ranging mapping technologies to scan the floor of the jungle. The scan showed a massive ancient city buried underneath trees and vegetation. Nobody knows who built the city or where the ancient people went. But archaeologists believe it could very well be the legendary city of the monkey god, spoken of in local legends but abandoned for centuries. It's a complete mystery, with almost no progress being made to identify the builders of this lost place. But in 2017, something else happened. A team of biologists led by Conservation International's Rapid Assessment Program and aided by the government of Honduras, went on a journey deep into the lush jungle of La Mosquitia. Not only were there mysterious, nameless ruins from some long-lost culture, there were also animals. The researchers identified 20 new species never seen before. They also found three species of animals believed to have gone extinct from Honduras. They found the pale-faced bat, the false coral snake, and a tiger beetle. This part of the rainforest is now frequently patrolled by the Honduran military in an effort to preserve the area. The government launched a program in 2018 to protect the remains of the ancient city, which remained untouched for centuries, something that is quite rare for any historical site. Jiaohe You can still see the Jiaohe ruins today alongside the ancient Silk Road. What's left of the city is surprisingly preserved after being deserted for centuries. The ancient metropolis was built 2,300 years ago, near what is now the city of Turpan in China. This is in Xinjiang, a dramatically different part of China both geographically and culturally. It's where the native Uyghur people live, who speak their own language and practice Islam. To the Uyghur, this city is known by a different name, Yar. Jiaohe was once a major stopping point on the Silk Road. The city was built on top of a cliff sandwiched between a pair of river valleys to form a natural fortress. The city had but two doors, walled on its other three sides by steep rock over 90 feet tall. This made the city a rather difficult place to invade, but that didn't stop it from being taken over several times. It was eventually captured by the Muslim Hui, then sacked by Genghis Khan and his Mongol army before it was finally abandoned in the 13th century. From that point, the city was lost. Today, Jiaohe's amazing preservation is thanks to the dryness of the region. In the summer, Turpan becomes one of the hottest places on the planet, recording temperatures of up to 152 degrees Fahrenheit. It's because of this inhospitable climate that no one really wanted to live here, and that the city remained deserted until modern times. But its walls are still standing, its streets and side avenues still walkable, and there are still houses and temples thousands of years old to be explored. Masada Masada is an ancient stone fortress located in Israel, built on a plateau high above the Dead Sea. It's one of the most remarkable ruins in the world, right at the edge of the Judean desert, 1,300 feet above the salt sea below. Because of the salt and the brutal desert climate, the area has, and will most likely always be, virtually uninhabited. But in the last century BC, Herod the Great of Judea decided the rocky mesa would be the perfect place for a stronghold. Masada was originally built as a castle complex, but in the next century when the Romans showed up and took over Judea, it became a major holdout for the Jewish people. In the year 66, a rebel group of Jews overtook Masada and kicked out the Roman occupiers. They turned it into a Jewish sanctuary city. When Jerusalem was burned to the ground in the year 70, everyone who was able to flee from the rampaging Romans fled and lived in the former palace of King Herod high up in the Mesa. But the Romans were not so easily discouraged. The very last community in Judea was held up in Masada. 
there were about 960 of them, many of them women and children, but a legion of 8,000 Romans went up the side of the mountain and destroyed them. From this point on, Masada was lost and forgotten. In the 5th century, some monks moved in and built a monastery, but they were gone two centuries later. Then, for 1,300 years, not a single soul walked through the streets of Masada. It wasn't discovered in modern times until 1828, then excavated by Israeli archaeologists in 1953. The City of Caves Underneath the English city of Nottingham, there is a city of caves. This vast subterranean lair of caves and complexes is still being explored today. It's an impressive system of over 500 caverns carved from thick sandstone. No one knows how long they've been around, but archaeologists estimate they are older than the city itself. There is nowhere else in Britain with more man-made caves than underneath the modern city of Nottingham. The first mention of them came in the year 893, detailed by a Welsh monk and historian named Asser. But before that, nobody really knew what they were used for. The caves were clearly already being used by the locals in the 800s. We can only assume they were occupied even further back. The biggest problem with trying to date the construction of the caves is that they lack any meaningful artifacts. Over the past thousand years, the caves have been used as dungeons, storage units, and brew houses for beer. Anything that may have been left behind by people more ancient has been completely lost. The caves were finally abandoned and forgotten in 1845. Up until that point, the poorest citizens of Nottingham had made their homes in the darkest and dankest recesses of the caves. It had turned into something of a refuge for the sick, despondent, and plain destitute. But the government decided enough was enough, and with the Enclosure Act sealed the caves. They wouldn't be used again until World War II as civilian shelters. Would you ever consider living in a cave? Let me know in the comments below. Tukume Tukume was the largest great capital city of the Lambayeque Kingdom. This kingdom ruled over the Lambayeque region of what is now Peru, on the country's northern coast. They showed up after the collapse of the highly advanced Moche culture, around the year 700. They were either a small tribe that gradually got stronger and started building complex settlements, or they were the remains of the broken Moche. Academics can't agree on if these were two separate cultures or if the Lambayeque was a continuation of the Moche. Either way, Tucume was their last major city. Construction began in the year 1000, with the city steadily growing to become a very important regional center. The city grew to be so grand that the Lambayeque abandoned their previous city at Batan Grande, a place rich with history and filled with pyramids. But don't worry, Tucume was filled with pyramids as well. They had divided the city into two main sections. The northern part was dedicated to religious worship and the construction of pyramids. The southern part of the city was industrial and residential. In total, in its 300 years of existence, the city sprouted 26 major pyramids. Yes, this was quite some time after Egypt had already built their pyramids, but 26 is still a pretty impressive number. Sadly, these people and their city were wiped out with the arrival of the Chimu culture in 1375. The Inca came after that in 1470, and the Spanish conquistadors in 1532. By the time the 1600s rolled around, Tucume and the memory of the Lambayeque kingdom were long gone. Aksum The lost city of Aksum in Ethiopia was once the seat of the powerful Aksumite Empire. This kingdom reached its height in the first millennium as a serious powerhouse in East Africa. The city was the center of ancient Ethiopia, which you may already know is considered one of the oldest inhabited places in Africa. At the same time Rome was conquering Europe and Persia was running wild in Arabia, the Aksumite Empire was cementing its power in Eastern Africa. They had ties to these other civilizations. They controlled all the trade going through the Red Sea, and they became wildly wealthy through the ivory trade with Sudan. These days, there is very little left of Aksum. The ruins of the city cover a massive area, complete with monolithic obelisks, royal tombs, and ruined palaces from the 6th century. In fact, the largest standing obelisk here is nearly 70 feet tall. It's about the size of a nine-story building. The largest obelisk any ancient human ever tried to erect is here as well, about 100 feet tall, but it's lying on its side. 
Archaeologists think it was probably destroyed when they tried to make the thing stand upright. The Aksumite Empire fell in the 10th century. The kingdom's importance began to decline, their power waned, and people started leaving the city in huge numbers. Eventually, the Ethiopian Empire was no more, and Aksum was a ghost town. Old Konzorsk Old Konzorsk is an abandoned cave city in the country of Armenia. Well, it's less of a city and more of a village. It can be found on the steep slopes of Khor Zor, over 4,500 feet above sea level. The houses here were carved out of the rocks of the hillsides, creating a complex network of cave dwellings that continued to be inhabited well into the 20th century. What made the ancient Armenians choose this spot is the fact that it was already riddled with natural caves. All they had to do was widen them, put in some furniture, and bam, they had pre-built houses. Some estimates have put the population to as many as 15,000 before the 1900s. That may not seem like a lot, but it was a lot of people living in what was basically an exposed anthill. The people here employed a complicated system of ropes and ladders to get around their community. The only way for their kids to get to school or for everyone to get to church was by climbing the steep hillside. This meant climbing up ladders that stretched vertically beside the entrances to people's houses. Sadly, the rich history of this place was erased in the 1950s. Soviet officials said living in caves was uncivilized and forced the few villagers still remaining to leave. It's only been about 70 years, but that was long enough for the city to be lost and forgotten. All that's left now is livestock grazing on grass. Pueblo Bonito Pueblo Bonito in the Chaco Canyon region of New Mexico is one of the greatest lost cities anywhere in North America. The city was built by the ancestral Puebloan people, also known as the Anasazi. Construction lasted about 300 years, between 850 and 1150, but about 150 years after the city was completed, it was deserted. What remains today is a cluster of rectangular rooms in a large hub, what archaeologists call a great house. They didn't build their homes separately with little yards and picket fences. They built all their houses on top of one another and piled against each other in a huge conglomeration like a high-rise honeycomb. Now here's what's really strange about Pueblo Bonito. Archaeologists have found very little evidence of domestic activity. These were obviously houses, although there were definitely ritual chambers for communal activities too, like feasting. But throughout all the ruins, almost no personal artifacts have been found. There have been a few things uncovered, like incense burners, marine shell trumpets, and copper bells. Macau skeletons have been found in tombs. Clearly, this was a complex society. And yet this scant evidence has made it almost impossible for archaeologists to tell much about their social organization. All we know is that something happened near the end of the 13th century and Pueblo Bonito, as well as the rest of the Chaco Canyon, was abandoned. Lost City of the King of the Gods For the first time in history, the lost city of Mahendra Parvata has been found hiding in the jungles of Cambodia. That's a bit of a mouthful, so you can call the city by its other name, the City of the King of the Gods. From what we know, thanks to historical records, the city was built in the 9th century as the first capital of the powerful Khmer Empire. You undoubtedly know of the Khmer's last capital, Angkor Wat, the biggest temple complex in the world. The Khmer ruled pretty much all of Southeast Asia from between the 9th and 15th centuries. They're one of the least talked about great powers of the old world, yet had a reign longer than Rome and controlled nearly as much land. Not quite as much, but still a lot. They conquered much of Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Because of the historical records, archaeologists have always known the city existed, but nobody has ever been able to find it because of the rough terrain in Cambodia. Plus, the Khmer Rouge dictatorship of 1975 to 1979 put down so many landmines in the area it was impossible to get through. The lost city has only now been found thanks to laser scans identifying the temples and palaces still hidden underneath the canopy of the jungle. El Dorado A group of explorers believe they may have solved the mystery of the lost city of El Dorado. The explorers were searching for ancient and abandoned towns deep in the jungles of Colombia when they found six cities located in the mountains. Albert Lin and his team of experts, all backed by National Geographic, used scanning methods to look for flat plots of land. They found six of them, most at heights of around 4,000 feet up the side of mountains. 
Albert then took his team by foot into the jungle with a military escort, at which point they discovered the remains of a mysterious lost civilization. They didn't actually find ruins, just scraps of pottery. It was obvious that at some time, somebody had been living here in the jungle, but it was impossible to say who. They couldn't even find the structures, just pieces of trash left behind by the ancient people. Sadly, there is no way to know if El Dorado, the legendary city of gold, really is somewhere in Colombia. But as we can now see, there was definitely a large community of people hiding in the vast mountain forests. And yet, with all our technology, their cities still remain lost. The Mystery of the Keyhole Scientists can't seem to figure out why ancient societies all over the world had a fascination with monuments in the shape of a keyhole. Civilizations that lived thousands of miles apart and at vastly different times in history all had an obsession with keyholes. For example, the Well of Santa Cristina in Italy was built as a sacred site by the Nuragic civilization sometime around the 12th century BC. It was crafted by remarkably skilled masons who had advanced knowledge of stoneworking. Sadly, nobody left behind any written records of what the keyhole-shaped well was used for. Archaeologists believe it had something to do with secret meetings and cultic rituals. There was a larger site around the well, although the well itself was the focal point of the shrine. It could have been a cult dedicated to fertility or some kind of water god. In Saudi Arabia, researchers recently found ancient tombs that are also quite old and a long way from Italy. Researchers with the University of Western Australia surveyed the hundreds of key-shaped tombs from a helicopter, shocked to see they make up a kind of highway of the dead through the desert. In Japan, there are the keyhole tombs, undoubtedly the most mysterious. In Osaka alone, there are over 44 burial mounds, each shaped like a keyhole. They are truly massive built between the 3rd century and 6th century AD. People of great social status were buried inside these megalithic keyhole tombs, including Emperor Nintoku. But still, we don't know why the keyhole shape was so important. According to Mr. Kurahashi, curator of the Sakai Museum, the shape is a symbol of power and authority. Somehow civilizations from around the world all came up with the same shape to represent something important. Now that's a very interesting coincidence. The Shagborough Inscription The Shagborough Inscription has been baffling scientists for years. It can be found on the grounds of Shagborough Hall in England, an inscription left on the Shepherd's Monument from the 18th century. There is an engraving of Nicholas Poussin's Arcadian Shepherds put up around 1748, and below it was a mysterious sequence of letters, O-U-O-S-V-A-V-V. -V -V. There is no explanation, no meaning, and the best code crackers in the world have never been able to figure out what the inscription says. This was a pretty big mystery, even in the 19th century. Some of the most famous minds of the age, like Charles Darwin and Charles Dickens, tried to solve the riddle and couldn't. The only person who has even come close is Keith Massey, a linguistics expert who was once recruited by America's National Security Agency. He used his expert knowledge of Latin to fill in the blanks, translating the code into English to, I pray that all may follow the way of true life. This was something like a prayer that could have been written on Christian tombs. While that does wrap things up nicely, not everyone believes it. One of the more outlandish theories is that the letters are a hint as to the whereabouts of the Holy Grail. Some say it was a surviving member of the Knights Templar who carved the letters into the stone as a final clue as to where the grail can be found, if it ever existed at all. The Taos Hum The city of Taos in New Mexico is a quiet community famous for skiing and mostly populated by artists and creative people looking for a laid-back lifestyle. Have you ever been there? Taos is also famous thanks to a strange phenomenon that scientists have never been able to solve. It's called the Taos Hum, and it just might drive you insane. The hum is what it sounds like. It was first reported in the 1990s by the residents of the town who described it mainly as a low droning hum that could be heard no matter where they went within the village limits. Some believe the hum is natural, some say it's a psychological issue with the people who can hear it, and some believe there is an underground base of aliens conducting experiments in mind control. The first man to study the hum was Joe Mullins, a professor at the University of New Mexico. He surveyed the residents of the town and found that about 2% could hear the hum. 
So Joe set up equipment in these people's homes to see if it could pick up what they were hearing with their ears. His equipment picked up nothing. The only thing Joe found out was that each person described the hum slightly differently, as a whir, a buzz, or a literal hum. This puzzled researchers because clearly people were hearing something, but they were all hearing something slightly different. To this day, science has never been able to explain the hum, although similar situations have been reported in Borneo, Canada, and England. Do you think people are actually hearing something? Or is it all in their heads? The Brazil Tablet The Brazil Tablet was supposedly brought across the Atlantic Ocean in 1310 by Malian explorers. This mysterious statue was left by the African explorers deep in the Brazilian jungle, then eventually picked up by the English explorer Percy Fawcett many centuries later. The tablet was described as having African pigment and features, clearly not made by any South American civilization, and yet picked out of an unexplored region in Brazil near the Kuluen River. The figure on the tablet is dressed in the fashion of a sailor from the Mali Empire in Africa, probably meant to represent a Malian royal traveling across the ocean on a boat. The tablet implies that African explorers reached the New World far before European explorers. Some say the Mali Empire not only reached South America, but also arrived in North America and built a settlement in the Four Corners area. The presence of the tablet in the jungle suggests they had been exploring when the artifact was lost. However, there isn't much more evidence to talk about. We don't even know where the famous Brazil tablet went after Percy Fawcett found it. It's nowhere to be seen today. Plus, there are no archaeological remains of Malian settlements in the West. They definitely could have made their boats and come across the ocean hundreds of years before Christopher Columbus. But if it's true, the information has either been obliterated from the history books or the evidence has simply gotten lost. What do you think happened to the tablet? Tell me what you think in the comments! The Hanging Gardens of Nineveh For centuries, archaeologists and historians have struggled to discover the truth behind the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Just like the Great Pyramids of Giza in Egypt, the Hanging Gardens were supposed to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But unlike the others, the gardens have never been physically found. Their ruins have never been uncovered where they supposedly should be in the old city of Babylon. But here's the thing. Dr. Stephanie Daly of Oxford University says the gardens weren't located in the city of Babylon, but 300 miles away in the city of Nineveh. Stephanie also claims the gardens weren't constructed by the famous Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, but by the Assyrian king Sennacherib. Stephanie put forth the theory in 1992 and then spent 20 years piecing it together. Her main piece of evidence comes from a bas-relief found in a palace in Nineveh, showing trees growing from a great colonnade in the palace. Plus, the city of Nineveh was also known as New Babylon, once the Assyrians conquered normal Babylon in 689 AD. The whole thing could just be a confusion between the two names. The whole point, though, is that scientists still don't know if the Hanging Gardens of Babylon ever existed, or where they were, if they were ever real. Just wanted to say a big thank you to Tactical Rhino and Andrew Jackson. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, welcome, and be sure to subscribe to join the Origins Explained family. The London Stone the London Stone has been identified as a Druid altar, a Roman milestone, and has been standing in London since prehistoric monsters roamed the land. In truth, this mysterious rock is a chunk of limestone seated in a glass case in the Museum of London. Previously, it had been in the iron grill of an office building from the 1960s with a bronze plaque saying its origin is a mystery. And yeah, that's true. There are so many myths surrounding the London Stone that it's hard to talk about all of them. Some say it was used by medieval kings and queens in ceremonies when they took control of London. Another myth is that if the London Stone is ever moved or destroyed, the city of London itself will crumble and die. The bizarre reality is that nobody knows where the London Stone came from or why it's so important. It's just kind of there and always seems to have been. Some believe it's the magical heart of London when it doesn't appear to be anything more than a brick of limestone. Why do you think the London Stone is such a mystery? Let me know your ideas in the comments below. Proof of Atlantis Depending on who you ask, Atlantis is about as real as Wakanda. Historians generally agree Atlantis is a fantasy world created 2,000 years ago by Plato, the Greek philosopher with a very active imagination. And yet people are still searching for Atlantis as we speak. 
One of these teams of researchers recently claimed that they discovered the exact location of the lost city, but not where you might expect. This group of amateur archaeologists is called Turanga Seta, and they are pretty hardcore about finding Atlantis. They believe the city is submerged 200 miles from the southern coast of Java in Indonesia. They arrived at this conclusion by looking at codes left behind by the ancient Javanese. They looked at geological abnormalities, traditional stories, and anecdotal evidence to come to their conclusion. This isn't all that scientific, and they haven't found any ruins, but they are confident Atlantis is down there. And if it's not, maybe it's somewhere nearby, waiting to be found on the ocean floor. Do you think Atlantis is real or just a myth? Jesus, the shapeshifter. In 2013, people started buzzing about a newly deciphered Egyptian text from 1200 years ago. The text described Jesus as being a shapeshifter. Yes, it seems the ancient Egyptians believed Jesus had the uncanny ability to change his shape. But perhaps what's even stranger than what was written in the old text is that all information about the study vanished after the initial headlines. The story began to cycle through major news websites, then it was gone and the study was seemingly abandoned. It seems like nobody wants to hear about how Jesus may have been shifting his shape, or what the mysterious Egyptian text is talking about. The text that was found was written in the ancient Coptic language by a distinguished theologian named Saint Cyril of Jerusalem in the 4th century AD. He tells the story of the crucifixion with one major plot twist. He says that Judas's famous kiss following his betrayal of Jesus was actually to make sure it was Jesus. Because he was known for changing shape, shifting skin tone, and morphing between a young child and an old man. It's quite a curious situation. The text is one out of 55 manuscripts discovered in 1910 in the ruins of the destroyed monastery of Archangel Michael in Egypt. The manuscript had been buried for about 1,000 years by monks who had stashed them in an underground stone vault. This is all very strange. What do you think? Aslan Aslan is the mythical home of the Aztecs, supposedly the land of the most ancient Mesoamerican civilization in human history known as the Mexica. According to the Aztec legends, the Mexica left their home in Aztlan to find a new one in the Valley of Mexico, in the area around modern Mexico City. Aztlan was supposed to be a luxurious place situated beside a large lake, where all were immortal and the resources were abundant. When they left this land, the Mexica found themselves in a terrible hell of thistle bushes, horrible weeds, poisonous lizards, deadly snakes, and suffocating heat. Then they made it to the Valley of Mexico and built their new city, later becoming the Aztec civilization. What scientists don't know is whether Aztlan was a real place or not. But what we do know is that there was a major migration of humans moving from northern Mexico and the southern United States starting around 1100. This migration had the native people moving through harsh scrublands filled with poisonous creatures and brutal temperatures. They eventually settled in the region around Mexico City. This much of the story is true. The biggest issue is trying to figure out where in the world Aztlan might have been. It must have been somewhere in the United States, somewhere with moderate temperatures, crystal lakes, and rich resources. But just like Atlantis, we still aren't sure if Aztlan was even real. Taming a prehistoric giraffe The Civatherium is an extinct genus of giraffids. Or in plain English, it was a type of giant primordial giraffe that used to roam across India and Africa. It was one of the biggest land animals in history, looking like an okapi but standing over 10 feet tall. Most scientists agree that the giant giraffe began going extinct 7 million years ago in the late Miocene period, then was completely gone by just 1 million years ago. But there is a bit of a discrepancy. In the ancient kingdom of Kish in Iraq, there was an enormous animal that looked an awful lot like a civatherium that was tamed and ridden by humans. At least, that's what the archaeological evidence shows us. Archaeologists have found rock paintings in the Sahara of gigantic giraffes, painted 8,000 years ago. During an excavation in Kish in the 1920s, an elaborate copper rain ring that was fixed to a chariot was discovered from 3500 BC. It was shaped just like a civatherium. It was incredible because most rain rings depict things like horses and ordinary camels. But this one was unique showing an enormous beast that couldn't possibly have existed back then. Or could it? This is what scientists can't figure out. We know that Sumerians tamed all kinds of wild animals, even allegedly taming deer to pull their chariots. 
but they also seem to have tamed wild, massive giraffes. As unlikely as this, there is a sliver of a chance that some of these beasts, just a few, survived until around 5,500 years ago, and that the Sumerians rode around on them like gigantic horses. Do you think the ancient Sumerians roamed around on gigantic giraffes? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. The Koso Range Petroglyphs The Koso Range can be found near the towns of China Lake and Ridgecrest, California. Here you can see some of the most spectacular petroglyphs left behind by Native Americans thousands of years ago. The Koso Range is littered with images including those of bighorn sheep, giant shields, and human-like forms. The figures were made rather simply by grinding and scratching designs into the surface of thousands of rocks. These are what we call petroglyphs, which are very different from pictographs. Petroglyphs mean the pictures were carved from the rock, while ancient pictographs were painted on top, just in case you were confused. The exact date the petroglyphs here were made is unknown. Most of them are estimated to be somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 years old. However, the practice of creating this style of artwork likely began much earlier, perhaps some 13,500 years ago, when humans first settled in the region. As soon as people made it to North America, they began experimenting with the artwork. After all this time, the biggest mystery is trying to decipher what the petroglyphs were meant to represent. The tradition has been lost for centuries, and there is no direct explanation for the strange figures and mysterious animals. Some experts believe Koso rock art is connected to hunting magic. Because of the immense number of sheep drawings that have been discovered in the area, researchers like Campbell Grant hypothesized in the 1960s that the bighorn sheep were necessary for local sustenance. The rock drawings may have been used as a way to make sure the next hunt would be a great success. This is one possible explanation as to why there are so many sheep petroglyphs in the region. Perhaps the ancient people believed that drawing and carving the images of the animals into the stone would conjure another bountiful hunt. Yil Bilinji Rock Art Archaeologists have been puzzled for decades by the strange outlines of human-like figures and strange objects at Yil Bilinji. Yil Bilinji is a site in northern Australia near the Gulf of Carpentaria that is the home to some of the rarest pieces of rock art in the world. The pictures date back roughly 500 years and mostly show scenes of humans holding boomerangs and other objects. What's unique is that the pictures were all made by stenciling. For at least the past 44,000 years, the Aboriginal people of Australia used stenciling in much of their rock art. They would hold an object against a piece of rock or even just their hand and then spray liquid pigment over it. This would leave behind a negative on the stone the exact size and shape of the object. What's so strange about the human figures at Il Bilinji is that they are miniature. The stencil tools and objects are also tiny. They were definitely created using stencils, but scientists have been struggling to figure out how the ancient Aborigines made such perfect stencils of people and things. In total, there are over 17 miniature humans, boomerangs, and complex geometric patterns on the rocky overhangs. After much deliberation, scientists believe the Aboriginal people made their stencils from beeswax. They heated the beeswax to gently mold it into the shape they wanted and then used that in all their stencil artwork. But we don't know why they did it. Scientists can't agree if the miniature art was for spiritual or ritualistic purposes or simply artistic expression. What do you think? Share your thoughts in the comments! Sego Canyon Sego Canyon is located north of Thompson Springs in Utah. It's a double feature of historical landmarks with both incredible prehistoric rock art and the remnants of an abandoned coal town. The petroglyphs and pictographs found just a few hundred feet from the ruins of the mining camp are some of the most mysterious in the entire country. The reason? The ancient art pieces were left behind by more than one culture. Archaeologists believe the Fremont culture left behind the drawings, and so did the people who came before them. The rock art here dates from as recently as 700 years ago and as far back as 9,000 years ago. The most recent contributors were those of the Ute tribe. Those who created rock art during antiquity, in the year 7000 BC, remain a mystery. Sadly, too much human activity in modern times has erased a lot of the artwork here. What few designs can still be seen are, quite frankly, a little mind-boggling. There are shapes of giant animals that look like mutant cows, as well as humanoid beings with round heads, big eyes, and looming bodies like shadows thrown against the wall. They look an awful lot like aliens, but mainstream scientists say they were probably just artistic representations of humans. 
Still, it's strange that none of the human figures seem to have arms or legs. Have you ever visited a ghost town? Let me know in the comments below. The Aliens of Wangina When the British arrived in Australia and first laid eyes on the ancient artwork in western Kimberley, they immediately connected the images to alien visitors. The idea has stuck ever since. In truth, the mysterious figures known as Wangina were drawn as representations of spirits. They can be found on cliff faces, inside countless caves, and on just about any large rock surface in western Kimberley. Without any context, it's easy to see why the first British colonialists looked at the thousands of images of the Wangina and thought it was surely meant to be aliens. They assumed a race of alien beings had visited the Australian Aborigines thousands of years ago. The British thought the Aborigines had recorded the aliens coming by drawing them on cave walls. What the Aborigines really documented was the Wangina, a sacred spirit respected by three major tribes in the area. It was viewed as the supreme being that created the land, passed down the rules of society, and was omnipresent, somewhat analogous to Judeo-Christian representations of God. They believed Wangina was in the trees, the rocks, and the air itself. It was everywhere yet intangible and untouchable. The rock drawings of their great deity have nothing to do with alien visitors, but it's easy to see how the mistake could be made. Have you ever seen anything like this? Let me know in the comments below. The Great Hall of the Bulls In the southwestern region of France, the Lascaux Cave is home to some of the most sophisticated cave paintings from prehistory. According to the Bradshaw Foundation, the artwork here is estimated to be around 20,000 years old. The pictures are exceptional due to their size, preservation, and masterful quality. The ancient cave people who made these paintings were highly advanced. They were basically the Michelangelos of the pre-ancient world. The paintings themselves aren't all that wild or shocking. They depict fairly ordinary things, like really big animals that were once native to the region. It's the unbelievable variety that really captivates the archaeologists and historians who visit the site. The Lascaux Cave has over 2,000 figures divided into major sections. There's the Great Hall of the Bulls, where you'll find mostly paintings of bulls and extinct aurochs. There is the Shaft of the Dead Man, the Painted Gallery, and even the Chamber of the Felines. The ancient people grouped everything into three categories, animals, abstract, and humans. It's amazing that such primitive people had the foresight to plan the cave system like an art museum, with each section having its own theme. There is even a giant bull over 17 feet long, the largest ancient cave portrait of an animal ever found. Why do you think they made it so large? Just wanted to give a big shout out to Travis Casanieva and Silver Wolf Mage. Love you guys and thanks so much for watching and spending time with us. If you are new here, welcome and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. The Mysterious Pictish The Picts were ancient people that lived throughout northern and eastern Scotland. When you think about the ancient Celtic people of Ireland, the Picts were the Scottish equivalent. They didn't leave any written records of themselves behind, and the people vanished about 1,000 years ago. Today, we know almost nothing about them. However, the Picts did leave behind examples of artwork that have baffled researchers for decades. For example, the Essie Cross Slab is a giant piece of intricately carved stone. It was made by a Pictish artist and is currently sitting in a churchyard in the town of Angus. The amazing artwork shows a typical Pictish hunter walking with his pack of dogs as they search for a stag. The meaning here is easy to decipher. The artist wanted to show a hunter in the act of actually hunting, but the stone also shows a mysterious winged figure in the top right corner. The figure is very worn with age, but seems to be a human-bird hybrid or an angel with four wings. To make matters even stranger, the right corner of the stone is broken. We can't see what was facing the multiple-winged angel on the other side. And this is only one example of hundreds of artworks completed by the Picts, scattered all over Scotland like lost grave markers. What do you think the winged creature on the stone is supposed to represent? Let me know your theories in the comments. Egyptian Portraits Scientists from Northwestern University in Illinois have done some fascinating work on old Egyptian portraits. They took three of the most immaculately preserved Egyptian paintings and digitally analyzed them. The analysis proved the paintings to be over 2,000 years old. They also discovered that all three portraits were made by the same person. Researchers were also able to source the pigment used in the different colors of paint. It almost certainly came from Greece, which could explain the obvious Greek style of the paintings. 
The researchers are now fairly certain that influence from Greece helped turn the Egyptians away from the old way of making artwork and into a more modern future. The portraits came from the days when the Roman Empire was in full control of Egypt. This was just after the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. Once Egypt was under Roman influence, they began to paint what is known today as the mummy portraits. The major difference was that before the Romans came along, Egyptians painted the faces of the deceased on their own coffins before they were buried. The person would be mummified, have their face stamped on the coffin, and then sealed in a tomb. After the Roman occupation, the Egyptians painted the faces of the dead on wooden panels instead. They would then place the portrait inside the coffin in a layer of linen and plaster, directly over the face of the mummy. The Villa of the Mysteries the Villa of the Mysteries is just like any other large villa in the ruins of Pompeii. It too was mostly destroyed during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD and then sealed under volcanic ash for 2,000 years. But while this villa may look like many of the others in Pompeii, it contains one very special feature. There is a room inside the villa decorated with mysterious and yet strangely beautiful artwork. The room is known to archaeologists as the Initiation Chamber as they believe it was involved in secret ceremonies and hidden rituals. The fresco images inside the villa show a ceremony taking place. The ritual appears to involve young girls and the psychological transition to becoming married women. In other words, this was likely a place within Pompeii where young girls set to be married came to make the necessary mental preparations with other women. One of the biggest clues is that the Greek god Dionysus is on the wall. Not only was he one of the most popular gods in classical Greece, but he was the most popular god for Roman women. He was viewed as the source of sensual and spiritual health. It makes perfect sense that whatever was happening in the transitional ceremony from girl to married woman, Dionysus played a part. Art in the Altai Mountains At a gravesite in Siberia, estimated to be over 5,000 years old, archaeologists came across unbelievable rock art. They found images of fantastical beasts, figures that look like aliens, and humans with horns, or perhaps what is meant to be feathers sprouting out of their heads. Experts believe those who made these drawings would have required scientific knowledge far beyond what a Neolithic person would have possessed. It's all quite strange. The mysterious rock drawings were found in a remote village tucked away in the Altai Mountains. The artwork decorated multiple graves at the ancient necropolis. Scientists working with the Kurchatov Institute in Moscow say the drawings were made using red ochre, soot, and ordinary rock scraping. This enabled them to use three colors in their pictures, red, black, and white. But it's the use of the red ochre that has really stumped scientists. In order to use such a color, they would have needed to heat the ochre to a certain temperature. It was only usable by creating a chemical reaction with heat. It's hard to believe that 5,000 years ago, primitive mountain dwellers who had no formal writing system were conducting experiments to create new colors of paint. Tassili Najer There are over 15,000 drawings and engravings to be found at the ancient site of Tassili Najer in Algeria. It's a vast plateau with one of the highest densities of paintings and prehistoric artworks in the world. The earliest paintings here are an estimated 12,000 years old. That said, the vast majority were drawn after 6000 BC. What's truly remarkable is that the pictures here tell a story that spans millennia. The drawings show the evolution of human life on the edge of the Sahara Desert. They also give a reliable account of the incredible change in climate, animal migrations, and human migrations. According to UNESCO, the carvings were first discovered in the desert here in 1933. After significant study, Researchers have been able to identify every individual era depicted in the paintings. 10,000 years ago, during the Roundheads period, locals who practiced religious magic made pictures showing their ceremonies. During the Cattle period, which began around 3000 BC, we can see images of daily and social life. This is where the art turns to natural realism, showing the taming of animals. Much later, around 1000 BC, we can see the domestication of camels and the rise of trans-Saharan trade networks. After humans domesticated camels and started trading with other societies, they stopped carving pictures on the rocks. What happened to them after that is a total mystery. Thanks for watching! What's your favorite mysterious piece of ancient art? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe! See you next time! Bye!